Hey, everybody, it's Congressman Jamie Raskin. Hello to all my friends out in Maryland's beautiful 8th Congressional District and our friends across Maryland and across the country. This is our beautiful 4th of July Independence Day weekend celebration. It is my favorite time of the week, local hero, and we get to salute the people who make life in our community uh, so rich and so extraordinary. And I've got an incredible true blue patriot for you as our local hero for this 4th of July week. Please welcome Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is our local hero uh, this week. Dr. Fauci uh, really needs no introduction, but that didn't keep me from um, writing up about seven pages about his extraordinary career. But I'm going to try to condense it to just one or two essential paragraphs. Um, he uh, spent uh, more than a half century of his career at NIH, um, 40 years as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He was himself both a basic scientist who did pathbreaking medical and scientific research that ended up saving lots of people's lives, and we will get into that. He also was the key scientific and medical figure in our um, national efforts to address several serious infectious diseases, including HIV AIDS and the Zika virus and COVID-19. He was a key advisor to seven presidents in their administrations on <clears throat> a breathtaking range of diseases, including HIV AIDS, respiratory infection, diarrhea, tuberculosis, malaria, as well as Ebola, Zika, and COVID-19. He has been the recipient of uh, the most prestigious awards in the land for doctors and scientists, including um, the National Medal of Science, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor that a, a civilian can get from the President of the United States, the George Cooper Medal of the Association of American Physicians. And now he is Maryland's 8th District's local hero for this week um, in July we could not be prouder of you, Dr. Fauci, and I wanted to be certain to recognize you, uh, not just as a great scientist and a great doctor, but as a great patriot for standing up consistently for the welfare and the common good of the people of America under very trying and difficult conditions. And this came home to me the other day when you were um, in the House Oversight Committee where I serve as the ranking member, and I was astonished to uh, witness several of my colleagues actually accuse you of creating the COVID-19 virus uh, in order to make money from it and to profit from it. And I was so astonished at that that I went to look online to see the whole slew of lies and myths and propaganda and disinformation that has now grown up around your career. And it's hard to imagine a career that has been more public spirited and more devoted to the service of our people and to saving us from disease and illness. So you are not a comic book supervillain. You are a great American hero, Dr. Fauci. And thank you for being our local hero in Montgomery County and in Maryland's 8th Congressional District. Thank you so much, Congressman Raskin. I really appreciate that. That's a and wonderful honor. Thank you. I wanted to start by talking about the HIV AIDS crisis when I think Dr. Fauci first burst into national recognition. Uh, that's certainly when I remember first hearing about you back when I was in college. Um, and that was a time of incredible disorientation, um, confusion, panic and anxiety as lots and lots of people, especially gay men, were just mysteriously dying. And you were thrust into the center of the scientific research. And I remember uh, even back then, lots of conspiracy theory and lots of political attention being focused on you. And the remarkable thing was how people who were questioning you came to rally around your leadership, um, which was so pathbreaking. And you ended up uh, steering and engineering the life-saving research that really ended up uh, saving tens of millions of lives in the country. And I wonder if you would tell us that story when President George W. Bush uh, appointed you essentially the, the point person in the country on HIV AIDS. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Raskin. As, as 
many people know, but the younger people probably don't know because they were either too young or not even born back then. But in the early 1980s, when we first became aware of this brand new devastating disease, predominantly among young, otherwise healthy, predominantly gay men, um, it was devastating their community. It turned out to be the HIV virus, which, as you mentioned, uh, I spent the first several years in the 1980s trying to find solutions to this, but taking care personally of desperately ill, young, mostly gay men. But over a period of years, we developed life-saving drugs in collaboration with the pharmaceutical companies that by the time we got to the mid-1990s, those drugs were so effective that they were able not only to save the lives of these young individuals, but also allow them to live essentially almost a normal life expectancy. That was a great accomplishment, but there was a great deal of disparity where the developed world had access to these drugs, but the developing world, particularly in Southern Africa, um, a phenomenal disparity, uh, almost an immoral disparity where drugs were available, but they could not afford it. And what President George W. Bush did, to his great credit, and, and, and he did it in a way that was a, a very directive of saying, and he told me this personally, Congressman, that he felt a moral responsibility that a rich country like the United States should not allow people to die from or suffer from a preventable and treatable disease merely because of where they happen to have been born namely in a developing region such as Southern Africa. So he commissioned me to put together a program which was aimed at preventing, treating, and caring for HIV in the Southern African region and in some countries in the Caribbean. To make a long story short, 20 years ago, I put together a program which he announced in the State of the Union address on January 28, 2003, that was originally to treat 2 million people, prevent 7 million infections, and care for 10 million people. Fast forward, fast forward 20 years, and that program has now spent $110 billion, is now in 50 countries instead of the original 14, and amazingly, but importantly, has saved 25 million lives in the developing world, which makes it unquestionably the most impactful public health endeavor in history. I mean, it, it's a remarkable story um, and undoubtedly came to infuse your perspective on how to deal with a crisis like that. And um, we know also about you know, the remarkable speed with which um, you work to deal with the Zika virus. Um, if we can skip over that one and go right to COVID-19, what has changed in the country since HIV AIDS? And how do those two experiences compare in your mind? Yeah, well, Jamie, as, as everybody knows, the, the COVID pandemic is the worst outbreak of a respiratory borne illness or, or any infectious disease in well over 100 years since the 1918 pandemic flu. Um, it is a formidable virus in and of itself. But one of the things relating to the difference that you're alluding to was that our response took place in an environment of profound, profound divisiveness in society. Back then, the PEPFAR program, which saved 25 million lives globally and certainly millions of lives in the United States, could never have happened if it were not for the bipartisan cooperation and collaboration, both in the authorization and the appropriations of that program, which was led by a Republican president. Now, fast forward to COVID, and as you can see, we have such divisiveness that things like wearing a mask or getting vaccinated has become a political issue where people make decisions about the acceptance or not of interventions based on political ideology which is terrible when you're talking about a public health endeavor. That's a major difference between our response to HIV and our response to COVID. Well, you've worked both as a, a basic scientist doing research, and then as you've discussed, trying to address uh, new pathogens and new viruses, um, but you've also worked 
in the public context as uh, you know, the, the director of the Allergy and Infectious Disease uh, Program at NIH, and you've had to deal um, in that political world. Does the polarization that you describe uh, make you regret having taken on these positions of huge public importance and significance? Um, do you wish you had just stayed in the lab coat? No, absolutely not, Congressman. Absolutely not. I think the accomplishments one can make in public uh, health and in public service far outweigh the negative aspects of the slings and the arrows. I wish that were not the case. I wish that there were people that embrace public health, which is really geared towards protecting and preserving the health of the men, of, of the citizens of our country and indirectly for the world, because we're such a leader in public health. But no, the benefit and, and the feeling of gratification and accomplishment far outweighs the negative aspect. But there are negative aspects in an anti-science environment. And that worries me because I don't want that to be a disincentive for young people to make a decision to get into public health or public service. And we certainly need lots more young people going into public health and into the, the sciences. Um, Say a word, if you would, about that new anti-scientific attitude that has permeated through the social media and uh, the internet and attacks on science and attacks on uh, public health expertise. Um, what can be done about that? And what is it that scientists and doctors can do? And then what can people who are not scientists and doctors do about it? Yeah. Well, obviously, it's a very corrosive effect because we're living in an arena now of what I call the normalization of untruths, that there is so much untruth and misinformation and disinformation out there that after a while, the people, the man and woman in the street, you know, trying to do a job or raise their family, they can't figure out what's true or not because you have such aggression and energy put into the spread of mis and disinformation that I don't think there's anything other than having to have people who care about the truth to be very proactive in putting out correct evidence-based and data-based information. So what I see is the people who spread misinformation seem to be very energetic about it, Congressman. It's almost as if they don't have a day job. They just spend all their time <laughs> spreading misinformation and the people who really care about the truth are, are busy doing things that are you know, beneficial for society. But I think we've got to get the rest of us who care about the truth to be more proactive there in getting the correct information out to counter the incorrect misinformation. Yeah, and of course, um, I guess it was uh, Mark Twain who said that the a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth can even get its boots on, right? Right, that's true. Um, and that was before the internet took place. So um, there has been uh, a torrent and a profusion of lies and conspiracy theories. And I, I just, I marvel at your ability to take it on and um, to refute it. And uh, your career just stands as a, a sparkling uh, testament to what science can do and to have participated in these pioneering scientific breakthroughs that saved tens of millions of lives time and time again. And always to go back, you could have retired a long time ago, decades ago, but you did not do that. You stuck with it. It just, it makes you um, a real hero of our age. And I am sorry that you've come under this ludicrous attack, which is an embarrassment to uh, American public life today, but um, the people are very much with you. Uh, Dr. Fauci, you are our local hero, and I hope that young people throughout Maryland's 8th District and throughout our state and across the country will study your work um, and uh, treat you as a role model for what you can do if you want to get involved in science and helping other people. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. I really appreciate coming from you. That's meaningful to me, very specially meaningful to me. And thank you for doing such a wonderful job in your district. We really appreciate it. Well, you're very kind and happy 4th of July to you. Thank you so much.